Welcome to the Human Health Campus Basic Nuclear Medicine Webinar Series. This webinar is entitled Basic Principles of Radionuclide Therapy and Common Clinical Applications and is presented to you by Marcel P. M. Stocke, MD, PhD from NKI AVL Netherlands Cancer Institute, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I am pleased to present this seminar to you on behalf of the Nuclear Medicine and Diagnostic Imaging Section of the International Atomic Energy Agency in collaboration with the European Association of Nuclear Medicine. In this webinar, we will focus on the following topics. Radionuclides used for radionuclide therapy, the cellular effects of this treatment, the common indications and aim of treatment, imaging and therapy evaluation, side effects of radionuclide therapy, single agent or combined radionuclide therapy, and finally, we will finish this webinar with the contraindications, precautions and regulations of radionuclide therapy. When we talk about the use of radionuclides, it has to be realized that in fact all forms of irradiation may cause treatment effects. The most commonly used form of irradiation are those radionuclides emitting beta particles. They have a typical path length up to 1.2 millimeters in tissue, causing a moderate linear energy transfer. Although the use of Auger electrons in the past was very popular, nowadays it is not common practice anymore. This is mainly due to the very, very limited effectiveness in clinical practice. On the other hand, the use of alpha particle irradiation will increase in the upcoming years. And this is mainly due to the very good results in clinical practice related to the application in bone pain palliation related to metastasis. When we have a closer look at the biological effects of irradiation, we know that the first events consist of physical interactions between radiation and water as well as biological compounds, followed by chemical and biochemical reactions. And this may finally cause molecular lesions in DNA, lipids, proteins, etc., etc., ending up in tissue effects. The first steps in this whole process usually take some parts of seconds. However, the overall tissue effects will take days up to months and can be observed sometimes after years. The most commonly used radionuclides for treatment in clinical practice are radioiodine, lutetium-177, yttrium-90, as well as bone-seeking agents. All of these radionuclides are used because of the beta emission. Some of them, however, also demonstrate gamma or photon emission, giving the opportunity to perform post-treatment imaging. Depending on the indication, they are either applied in a labeled or unlabeled form. The use of alpha-emitting radionuclides may increase in the upcoming years, which is mainly due to the highly effective irradiation related to the high linear energy transfer. In this respect, however, it has to be realized that the irradiation itself may be highly effective, but it may cause very severe toxic effects and side effects when not used in a proper way. In the following slides we will have a closer look at the cellular effects of radionuclide treatment. The first multiple choice question related to this topic in this webinar is as follows. Radiation induced cellular effects are due to A B C or D. 
please give the right answer. The right answer is B. It is due to self-irradiation, bystander and crossfire effects. And the explanation will be given in a short while. The next multiple choice question is as follows. Through direct and indirect ionization, radiation may produce the following DNA lesions. Have a close look at the answers. A, B, C or D. And the right answer in this respect is D. All of these aforementioned effects may be produced by irradiation. The cellular effects that can be observed in relation to irradiation can be caused either by a direct ionization pathway or an indirect ionization pathway. Regarding the direct ionization pathway, it can be observed that irradiation may cause a direct oxidation of biological compounds such as DNA, lipids or proteins. Regarding the indirect ionization pathway, in fact, irradiation causes water radiolysis, and this ends up in the production of reactive oxygen species. And finally, with the production of radicals and free radicals, it may end up with the same oxidation process of biological compounds. Depending on the repair system, different cellular effects can be finally observed. Regarding irradiation and tissue effects, which of the following statements is true? A B C or D. And the right answer is B. Regarding the distribution of ionization and excitation along particle tracks, it can be stated that high lead are more deleterious than low lead radiation. In addition, ionization and excitation produced by photons and electrons are sparsely produced in a large targeted volume and over a wide range compared to high lead radiation. As the weight of an alpha particle is very high compared to the weight of an electron, it is not deflected and the track of the particle is almost linear and the track path length low. And finally, Auchet electrons and low energy electrons with a very low energy, behave like high lead particles, but the range is below one micrometer. Regarding radionuclide therapy, DNA is the main target of direct and indirect effects. Through this direct and indirect ionization, radiation may produce single or double strand breaks, DNA protein or DNA-DNA cross-link formation, base loss and base modifications. DNA has been considered for long as the only main subcellular target. DNA lesions are used for explaining the target theory. However, it's now clear that this must be reconsidered. Other subcellular targets like proteins, fatty acids, etc., etc., need to be considered. Now we know that radiation affects subcellular compartments such as DNA, cell membrane, and mitochondria. We 
it has to be realized that this effect is not only established by self-irradiation alone, but it is also due to crossfire effects from neighboring cells. Now, the final outcome of self-irradiation and the crossfire irradiation depends on the repair capacity of cells or tissue. When there is a complete repair, cells will survive, and that causes no consequences on tissue level. When there is a misrepair, it will definitely cause stochastic effects, genetic effects, and cancer induction. And finally, when there is no repair, it will definitely cause cell death, also called non-stochastic effects, the antitumoral effect, but also toxicities. So the overall outcome in radionuclide therapy depends on activity, type of irradiation, and also repair mechanisms. Another effect that is related to irradiation is the bystander effect. Which of the following statements on bystander effects is true? A, B, C, or D? And the right answer is C. There is no dose-effect relationship In addition to the targeted effects in nuclear medicine or radionuclide therapy, it has to be realized that the contribution of non-targeted effects cannot be neglected. The paradigm of radiobiology considering that biological effects are proportional to the absorbed dose, therefore may be questionable in some situations. And we also know that in addition to the self-irradiation and the crossfire irradiation, bystander effects may play an important role. And this is an effect, the bystander effect, that occurs in cells that have not been crossed by particles. This bystander effect is accompanied by a lack of those effect relationship. So the old paradigm with a linear dose effect relationship may be changed by a new paradigm caused by the bystander effect. This bystander effect is probably caused by the release of toxic agents from cells hit by self irradiation or crossfire irradiation. Because of the self irradiation effects, the crossfire effects, and the bystander effects, the symmetry in radionuclear therapy is highly recommended. Now, the next question is related to this. Dosimetry is highly recommended since... And then you can choose between the following answers. A, B, C, or D. The right answer is D. It provides good insight into the dose delivered to a tumor. However, it is very, very unpredictable what the bystander effects may cause. And also, crossfire irradiation, we have a good estimate of it, but a very clear direct correlation is very difficult to be made. Now, despite the unpredictable bystander effects, dosimetry remains highly important in radionuclide therapy. and the use of calculated doses in clinical practice are highly recommended. The reason is as follows. It gives a good estimate and assessment of effects, but also of side effects. Moreover, it can be used for dose adjustment in clinical practice. In clinical practice, however, most centers use fixed doses for radionuclide therapy. Those who favor the use of fixed doses use the following aspects in this. First of all, the differences in clinical outcome 
are limited, for example, in differentiated thyroid cancer, but also in the treatment of hyperthyroidism. It is less time consuming compared to calculated doses. And finally, it has been stated that not all effects can be really estimated properly, for example, related to the bystander effects. However, it has to be regarded still as common practice to use and apply dosimetric calculations in clinical practice. We now move on to common indications for radionuclide therapy and the aims of treatment. In this table, the most common indications of radionuclide therapy are presented. It all started with the application of radioiodine, but as can be seen, many more radiopharmaceuticals have become available over the past years for the treatment of either benign or malignant diseases. It has to be realized that the aim of treatment differs per entity, per disease. On the one hand, we are able to influence disease-free survival rates or overall survival rates. And this can be observed, for example, in hyperthyroidism or in thyroid cancer. On the other hand, we are able to influence progression-free survival rates. And usually this goes hand in hand with symptomatic relief of symptoms, for example, in patients with painful bone metastasis or symptoms related to hormonal excretion, for example, in neuroendocrine tumors. And diseases in which stable disease can be achieved by the application of radionuclide therapy are, for example, lymphoma, neuroendocrine tumors, bone metastasis from prostate cancer, but also prostate cancer. Regarding the data and literature and its relation to outcome overall, it has to be realized that indications may change over years. Now the next question is related to the application of radioiodine therapy. The question is, is it always indicated in the following diseases? A, B, C, D or E? Now, the right answer to this question is E. It has to be realized that over years, indications for treatment, and especially radioiodine treatment, have changed. And what was regarded as standard care may become optional in entities like hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease, or thyroid cancer. Now, regarding the clinical indications and the overall outcome, it is good to realize that there are differences in overall survival and disease-free survival rates, etc., etc. And therefore, it is highly important to have knowledge on what has been found and presented in literature. So the next question is, which of the following statements is true? A, B, C, or D. The right answer is C. One is true, statement two is false. It is not a prolonged disease-free survival, but a progression-free survival. In relation to the treatment outcome, it is also highly important to have a closer look at the aim of treatment related to different entities. For example, when we look at the use of radioiodine therapy in thyrotoxicosis, there are definitely differences between Europe and the United States. Consequently, it is highly important to have a very, very close look when reading the data in literature where the study was performed. For example, in Europe, the aim of treatment in hyperthyroidism is the euthyroid status, whereas in the United States, the aim of a treatment is a non-toxic status, which can also be an a-thyroid status. 
in the next slides some examples are shown in which differences in treatment outcome are presented. The first slide is related to the use of radioiodine for non-toxic goiter and the aim of treatment with radioiodine is to relieve symptoms which in fact means reducing the volume of the goiter. It has to be realized however that reducing a goiter volume does not always mean a symptomatic relief. There is not always a linear relation between what can be measured by scans or blood tests and a reduction in symptoms. Another example is the impact of radioiodine therapy in differentiated thyroid cancer. For many years it has been thought that the application of radioiodine will improve mortality rates and overall survival rates. However, as can be seen in this table, this is not true. And even its role in Improving recurrence rates is debatable. And this is a typical example of the influence of radionuclide therapy on progression-free survival rates. The addition of radioembolization to Folfox treatment slightly improved the progression-free survival rates in patients with colorectal cancer metastasis in the liver. Regarding the response rates in hepnets to radio-labeled somatostatin analogs, it can be seen that in many patients, up to 80% of the patients treated with radio-labeled somatostatin analogs, stable disease can be achieved. However, one of the most important outcomes in this patient population is symptomatic relief. Recent studies have shown promising results related to the use of radio-labeled somatostatin analogs in the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors, indicating a prolonged progression-free survival rate in this entity. Another example in which the overall response rate has been improved by the use of radionuclide therapy is the application of zevalin or radio-labeled rituximab in lymphoma patients and it can be observed that the overall response rate significantly improved compared to the use of non-labeled rituximab. And finally we know the application of bone-seeking radiopharmaceuticals in patients with painful bone metastasis. There are several radiopharmaceuticals available, all with different characteristics. For example, strontium, samarium or rhenium. And the choice of the radionuclide depends on the half-life, the path length of the emitted radiation in tissue and also the aim to perform post-treatment scanning. Now, irrespective of the radiopharmaceutical that has been used, you can see in this table the results of several clinical studies on radionuclide therapy within the last decade. And as can be seen, almost all radiopharmaceuticals achieved the same results, which means pain relief in about 60 to up to 90% of the patients. However, Overall survival rates or progression-free survival rates have not been observed in these populations. Now, with the introduction of alpha-emitting radionuclides, it can be observed that the aim of treatment in clinical practice in prostate cancer patients will change from symptomatic relief to improving overall survival rates. 
In this LSIMCA trial, it was observed that the overall survival improved from 11.2 months in the placebo group to 14 months in the radium-223 treated group. And this means that not only indications change over the years, but also the aims of treatment will change in close relation to the previous slides on the aims of treatment and indications, it is highly important to have some knowledge on imaging and therapy evaluation aspects. In this respect, pre-treatment and post-treatment scanning is highly important either to predict response or to evaluate treatment effects. Now, this question is related to post-treatment scanning, what is not regarded as standard indication for this? A, B, C, D, or E? And the right answer is B. The reason is quite simple. Strontium is the only radionuclide not emitting photons, so there is no option for post-treatment scanning. Now, regarding the evaluation of treatment, and to have insight into overall survival, progressive-free survival, etc., etc., it is also highly important to know that response prediction becomes more and more important. And with response prediction, we want to avoid initiation of futile treatments, but it also gives us the possibility to prognostic stratify patients prior to treatment. And regarding response assessment, it is highly important to know that evaluation of a treatment is not only to assess the outcome, but also to avoid prolongation of futile treatment but it also includes evaluation of side effects. Now, regarding radionuclide therapy assessment, some comments have to be made. First of all, radionuclide therapy delivers durable, low-dose rates in radiation, producing concomitant physical and biological effects. Secondly, cellular mechanisms involved in radiotherapy-induced cell death are still poorly understood including cell arrest at G2 M phases, explaining the more frequent stabilization as compared to objective response. And finally, because of these mechanisms, PET could be a better surrogate marker of response than anatomic imaging. Now, regarding the role of PET and radionuclide therapy, we know that PET can be performed using metabolic traces as FGG or more specific radiopharmaceuticals directed against specific tumor biomarkers, especially biomarker targeted for radiotherapy in theranostics approach becomes more and more important in this respect. Moreover, PET could be applied to select patients before radionuclide therapy or to assess radionuclide treatment efficacy. In fact, PET can be used to predict and to assess outcome in radionuclide therapy. And this is just an example of the role of gallium dotatate PET in neuroendocrine tumors and its comparison with sequential planar lutetium dotatate scanning and such studies underline the predictive value of PET scanning in clinical practice related to radionuclide therapy. Now, in addition to treatment, treatment scanning, also post-treatment scans are highly important in therapy evaluation, but also in response prediction. In general practice, most of these scans are performed four to seven days after providing radionuclide therapy. And examples of this are radioiodine treatment in thyroid cancer, but also MIBT therapy in neuroendocrine tumors. 
with the introduction of lutetium dota talk or with the application of samarium it is even possible to perform scanning at the same day or 24 hours post injection the most important indications for post treatment scans are to get a better insight into the uptake in the primary tumor in benign tissue to get insight into the biodistribution of the radiopharmaceutical it gives you the opportunity to perform dosimetric calculations and it also restages patients and a well-known example is the application of spec ct after radio iodine treatment in thyroid cancer so the combination of pre-treatment and post-treatment scans provides in fact the best information what to expect regarding the evaluation of radionuclide therapy it is also highly important to realize that during this process it remains important to get information on the side effects of radionuclide therapy now regarding the effects and side effects which of the following statements is true one deterministic effects have a threshold of dose and the severity of the effect is dose related two stochastic effects have no dose threshold but the severity of the effect is not dose related is the right answer a b c or d the right answer is a one is true two is false and in the upcoming slides we will clarify this answer when we talk about side effects it is good to realize that there are in fact two forms of it the deterministic side effects and the stochastic side effects we know from the deterministic effects that there is a threshold and when the radiation dose is below that no side effects will be observed after beyond this threshold the severity increases with an increase in radiation dose regarding the stochastic effect it is not the severity but the risk on side effect that increases with the radiation dose in fact it is an off on effect it will occur or not and as you can see in this slide the risk of stochastic effects is much higher in children than in elderly patients now regarding the stochastic side effects what are the most common effects of radionuclide therapy in clinical practice a b c or D the right answer is D nausea and vomiting and painful salivary and dysfunction of lacrimal glands are deterministic effects and cancer induction is not a common stochastic side effect it is a rare side effect and here in fact you see the answer to the previous multiple choice question the difference between the deterministic effects and the stochastic effects and it is good to realize that the stochastic effects can uh, be subdivided into cancer induction and genetic alterations or hereditary diseases in this table the threshold for deterministic effects is presented for testis ovary the eyes and bone marrow and as you can see one single absorption or a prolonged absorption with gray per year will definitely have consequences or influences on the different organ systems over years now regarding these stochastic effects it is good to realize that with the treatment of cancer cancer may also be induced and we know for example that leukemia is one of the 
reported stochastic effects related to radionuclide therapy. Now, regarding the risk of second primary cancer following treatment with radionuclide therapy, you can see here in this table the standardized incident ratio related to differentiated thyroid cancer treatment. And it can be seen from this data that overall there is a slight increase in cancer induction, but the overall risk of second primary tumors remains very, very low. Regarding the risk on second primary tumors related to or caused by radionuclide therapy, it is good to realize that the age of diagnosis and the age of treatment is important in this respect. The younger the patient, the higher the risk on second primary tumors. In addition, the risk of second primary malignancies remains slightly elevated up to three decades after the treatment with radionuclide therapy, and that in fact is irrespective of the radionuclide treatment that has been applied. In the upcoming slides, several non-stochastic effects will be presented and discussed briefly. It starts with a multiple choice question. Which of the following statements is true? Semen preservation is A, B, C or D. And the right answer is B. Semen preservation is recommended prior to tr repeat the treatment with radioiodine in male patients. We move on to multiple choice question 12. Which of the following statements is true? In female survivors of differentiated thyroid cancer, there's much evidence to support important adverse effects of radioiodine therapy on gonadal function and fertility. Two, permanent sterility is expected after a dose of three gray to the ovaries. Which of the statements is true? The right answer is A, B, C, or D. The right answer is B, one is false, two is true. And it is in fact that there is much evidence to support little adverse effects of radioiodine therapy instead of important effects. Regarding the common non-stochastic side effects or deterministic effects, we are able to subdivide these effects in transient and persistent effects. Transient side effects are nausea, vomiting, painful salivary glands and dysfunction of the lacrimal glands, a flare effect in painful bone metastasis, hematological side effects and male and female fertility. In contrast, there are known persistent side effects such as lung fibrosis and bone marrow dysfunctioning such as myelofibrosis. Now, regarding the side effects of the salivary gland, the most reported side effect is acute swelling, which is observed in up to 67% of the patients, with an increased risk on it in repeated doses. And it has been stated that good hydration and the application of candies after 24 hours after administration are options or recommendations to avoid this. Other side effects as xerostomia and taste changes are also frequently observed in clinical practice and it has to be realized that xerostomia in 4.4% of the patients can become complete. The use of recombinant TSH may lower this risk but data and literature on this topic are scarce. Regarding the effects on male fertility, especially in relation to the application of radioactive iodine, it is good to realize that spermatogonia have a high mitotic rate and are therefore classified in the group of the most radiation sensitive cells. On the contrary, according to the classification of Rubin, lighter cells belong to the class of more radio resistant cells. We know from data in clinical 
practice and data in literature that after external irradiation, transient sterility can be induced by a low dose to the testis and slightly higher dose to the ovaries. However, permanent sterility is to be expected after higher doses, which means that, for example, in the application of radioiodine treatment, semen preservation is highly recommended when repeated treatment is expected. Radionuclide therapy may also cause menstrual effects in female patients, and usually this is observed within the first year after treatment, for example, after radioiodine therapy. We know ovarian failure is observed in up to 30% of the patient, usually transient in the first year, whereas an increase in FSH is also transient within the first years and observed in up to 30% of the patient. Permanent dermage is rarely, if not all, observed in this patient group. Regarding the reproductive outcomes in relation to radioiodine therapy and radionuclide therapy in general, we know from different studies in literature that there is in fact no significant increase in miscarriages and no significant effects on infant outcomes. In studies by Sarkar, Balenovic and Kassara, in which a study population was compared with a normal population, there were no significant differences in outcome observed. One of the most important side effects in the lung that can be observed is radiation pneumonitis in patients with diffuse metastasis from differentiated thyroid cancer. In up to 6% of the patients, this severe side effect may be observed and the only way to avoid this side effect is not giving more than 125 milligrams of radioiodine or to increase an interval between treatments up to more than six months. And if this side effect radiation pneumonitis occurs, the risk on pulmonary fibrosis is extremely high. One of the most common and well-known side effects are related to the bone marrow, transient leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. However, data and literature on the incidence are still rare. High-risk patient groups can be identified, and especially patients with an age above 45 years, patients with bone metastasis, short intervals between therapy and high cumulative doses are indicative for an increased risk. Usually, the side effects are dose-dependent and commonly reversible. Leukemia may occur as a second primary tumor caused by radionuclide therapy, but the incident is less than 1%. Also in this respect, we are able to identify high-risk patient groups, short interval, high doses and high age. It is usually acute myeloid leukemia, but the lat latency period is usually more than five years, which means that it is sometimes very difficult to establish a clear relation between radionuclide therapy and the induction of leukemia. So far, we have been discussing radionuclide therapy as a single agent, but nowadays more and more papers have shown the value of combined radionuclide therapy in which radiopharmaceuticals are used in combination with radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Regarding the combined treatment, which of the following statements is true? 1. Radiosensitizers are physical and chemical agents that increase the lethal effects of radiation when administered in conjunction to radiotherapy. Two, synergistic treatments effects are regarded as the creation of a whole that is greater than the simple sum of its parts. A, B, C, or D.
what is the right answer? The answer is D. They are both true. Regarding the combined treatment, we can say that it can be used to improve control of the local disease through the additive killing of tumor cells by two different modalities. And it is either a synergistic effect, which is the creation of a whole that is greater than the simple sum of its parts, and the additive effect, which is an effect wherein two or more substances or actions used in combination produce a total effect, the same as the arithmetic sum of the individual effects. And regarding the synergistic effect, radiosensitizers have been advised as drugs that makes the tumor cells more sensitive to radiation therapy. Regarding the additive effect, pre-targeting in radioimmunotherapy or preloading in PRRT or MIBG can be regarded as that. Radiosensitizers, as typical examples of agents that may cause a synergistic effect, can be subdivided into physical and chemical agents and they increase the lethal effects of the radiation when administered in conjunction to radiotherapy or in particular radionuclide therapy. Regarding the physical sensitizers, it is known that they are able to overcome hypoxia by eliminating it with treatment that increases the delivery of oxygen to the tumor for example, by increasing the oxygen carrying capacity of blood and tumor to blood flow. Examples of the physical agents are hyperbaric oxygen, carbogen, archon or hyperthermia. In contrast to the physical sensitizers, we also have chemical sensitizers or agents to eliminate hypoxic cells. Examples of these chemicals are modifiers of hemoglobin, hypoxic cell sensitizers, hypoxic cytotoxins and bioreductive drugs targeting of hypoxic cells, biologic modifiers and chemotherapeutic drugs and especially this latter one, as well as hypoxic cell synthesizers are more and more used in combination with radionuclide therapy. Regarding hypoxic cell synthesizers, nine different drugs have reached clinical evaluation. Nitroimidazoles induce the formation of free radicals and depletes radioprotective thiols thereby sensitizing hypoxic cells to the cytotoxic effects of ionizing radiation. And typical examples are misonidazole, metronidazole and benzonidazole. They all have the same structure. Regarding the application of chemotherapeutic agents in combined modality treatment, Several agents have already been described in literature. Those agents that target DNA and agents that do not target DNA but other aspects of a cell or characteristics of the cell. Gemcitabine, EGFR blockers, VEGF antibodies, etc. etc. They all have a different method of action but in combination with radionuclide therapy, they seem to be highly effective. Here you see a first example of the combined use of a chemotherapeutic drug and radionuclide therapy. Gemcitabine causes a sensitization of a tumor and it involves initial abrogation of the G2 arrest and blocked DNA damage repair by interference with RAD51. And this is a typical example of a synergistic effect. And here we see the results. 
The findings of this study suggest that the cell killing efficacy of trastuzumab following gemcitabine pretreatment may be associated with an abrogation of the G2M checkpoint, inhibiting of DNA damage repair and gromatin remodeling. And here you can see another example in which PRRT is described in correlation with chemotherapeutic agents, the focus on the future developments. And on this slide you see typical examples of combinations of PRRT with other therapeutic agents, gemcitabine, mitomycin, cisplatin, doxorubicin, temosolomoide, all agents that are commonly used as single agents in clinical practice. And as you can see from the results, doxorubicin and lutetium dotatoc was 14% more effective than lutetium dotatoc as single agent. Comparable studies and results have been found with cisplatin, also other agents influencing cross-linking DNA or repair inhibition will or may improve the effect of lutetium dotatate as single agent. We already know also from other studies in which other radionuclides are used, for example in radioembolization, that the therapeutic effects increase when used in combination with chemotherapy. Regarding radionuclide therapy in general, it is good to know and have knowledge on the contraindications, precautions and regulations related to this. Now the first question is related to the contraindications and what are in general absolute contraindications for radionuclide therapy? Is the answer A, B, C or D? The right answer is pregnancy and breastfeeding. All other answers are not absolute contraindications for radionuclear therapy. Here you see effect the answer to the previous multiple choice question. The general contraindications for radionuclide therapy are absolute or relative and absolute contraindications are pregnancy and breastfeeding and that is in fact irrespective of which radionuclide is used for therapy. Relative contraindications are children, planned pregnancy and hematological abnormalities. However, however, you have to think about it twice when applying radionuclide therapy in these high-risk patient groups. And if you are planning radionuclide therapy in these subgroups, think about dose reduction. Regarding dose reduction, other conditions may also require this in clinical practice. Which of the following conditions may not require re dose reduction in radionuclide therapy, for example with iodine-131-MIBG? A, B, C or D? The right answer to this question is C, treatment with drugs that may interfere with uptake. We know that recent chemotherapy, recent radiotherapy and hematological abnormalities are absolute aspects that have to be taken into account when planning new radionuclide therapy. Treatment with drugs that may interfere with the uptake may require dose reduction but it may also require an increase in dose because of the blockage of uptake in a tumor. So be very careful 
and have a very good look at the records of a patient, but also the medication a patient is using. Regarding radionuclide therapy, it has to be realized that there may also be other specific conditions, and you have to take them into account. For example, radionuclide therapy in thyroid disorders, beware of uncontrolled thyroid toxicosis or heart failure, severe dysthyroid eye disease. It all has to be under control before applying radionuclide therapy. Radio embolization is another example. Previous external radiation therapy to the liver, malignant acetus or clinical liver failure, abnormal blood circulation due to anatomic variations resulting in backflow to the stomach, pancreas or bowel, all indications to have a better look at the patient and the indication for treatment. Other specific conditions can be found in PRRT or MIBG in the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. Has the patient had recent chemotherapy or radiotherapy? Are there drugs that may interfere with the uptake? Are there hematological conditions such as leukopenia or thrombopenia? In fact, there are not a contraindication for treatment itself, but it depends on the level or the value of leukocytes and thrombocytes. And regarding pain palliation due to bone metastasis, what are the hematological conditions? Are there neurological symptoms? Is there uptake on bone scintigraphy or not? Etc. Etc. So you have to be very careful, have a good look at specific conditions that may interfere with the radionuclide therapy. Finally, it is good to realize that radionuclide therapy requires specific precautions and patient preparations, hydration, medication, consultation, all aspects that have to be taken into account. In addition, all radionuclide treatments follow specific regulations and it depends on the local and national authorities what is allowed and what not. It is strongly recommended to have a good look at the specific guidelines and should be followed as much as possible. One, to improve the effects. Two, to avoid side effects. Most of the guidelines can be found in the list of references. Thank you very much for your attention.